What's going on, everybody? Happy Friday. You know what Friday means. Friday on my channel means special guest. And today's special guest is the great Johnny Dale. Everyone, welcome, Johnny. How you doing, Johnny, man? Thank you for being here, bud. Oh, man, I'm doing fantastic. Uh, thank you for having me. It's been a great, great couple of weeks out here in Alabama. We had some storms come through. It was supposed to be, you know, oh, in Alabama, we, we're, we've we sort of become the new Tornado Alley. And, uh, and you know, stuff's about to get real when you start seeing the storm chasers roll through you're like oh no all right i better have that helmet ready you know they always tell people put a helmet on and go get in your in your bathtub um and so we had some come through thankfully they went right around us and it's just been like upper 60s every day bright and sunny you look like you're you're bundled up for the winter man <laughs> well california this is considered cold and uh i forgot to leave my heater on last night so it's a little chilly but it's like i don't know 55 60 right now and that's considered pretty cold you know out here my, yeah my aunt lives in paradise uh and oh yeah so you know she so lost far. her house a number of years ago yeah uh during those wildfires well she uh had just sent me a picture last night that it was snowing there i was like what in the world snowing in paradise yeah. no way yeah poor did she, did she lose her house in paradise she did. Yeah. I had a couple ants that lived there, but you know, thankfully they got out. That was the biggest thing. They got out and then they've been able to rebuild and, and, uh, and, and, you know, get everything back to normal there as much as normal could be in that situation. Yeah. These wildfires are insane out here. I saw, I sell, I'm a real estate broker, mortgage lender. And whenever I sell houses to people, um, in that live in the woods, they have to get a special fire policy. And it's like, it's like $350, $400 a month just for the fire policy, not including the regular homeowner's insurance. So, uh, yeah, it's it's a problem out here. I didn't realize you were in Alabama, man. So I, I take it you're a big uh, Bama fan, huh? Um, you know, most is okay. So, so I moved out here about 10 years ago and some people, you know, when I, I was heading this direction, they were like, all right, you, you know, you need to make a choice. And, and it was put this way, the moment you step foot, in Alabama, you got to make a choice, and that is: Are you Roll Tide? Are you War Eagle? And I was like, "What?" They go, "This will determine yeah. the the trajectory of your life here in Alabama." Yeah. And I like a lot of players out of Alabama. I didn't like Cam Newton at the time, so I was like, "Well, I'll Roll Tide." Um, so I like sort of half heartedly Roll Tide, but mm -hmm. I just I, I've told people I'm like I don't have the emotional capacity to take on another football team. I, yeah. I'm I'm in with the 49ers. I just can't emotionally commit to another team. I I, I get a little you know yeah hey, hey, they won, uh, but it, it's not like the 49ers. I don't get bummed out when they lose or anything. So where did you come from originally before Alabama? Uh, I grew up in Oregon and then I moved gotcha. from Washington State. Uh, okay. So I lived in outside Seattle uh, for about seven years. Lived in the state capital for a little while, but grew up in a suburb of Portland, Oregon. Yeah, so uh, I'm a West Coaster. And you're like uh, my guy, Jesse Naylor, same thing. Yeah, he went from, from there to Florida. So, uh, yeah, interesting, man. Uh, yeah, we got a lot to talk about today. Just for everyone knows, I got some like kind of source source information that you never heard anywhere else. Also got to sit on a call with Charvarius Ward, which was interesting. I got a funny story in regards to that. So we're going to dive into all that stuff. Uh, I do want to address a couple things real quick. I've been uploading everything to podcast for the last couple of weeks. So wherever podcasts are available or you guys listen to podcasts make sure you follow the ryan g hensley uh show on podcast form as well and then something that i've been plugging this week um really important to me is i, I started a second channel last year kind of like messed with it a little bit but i restarted with a whole new concept that i'm really excited about and I, next week i start doing it i'm going to be interviewing self-made millionaires um and just trying to learn from them and help my audience learn from them and see what they did the, the rules are you got to be a self-made millionaire, right? You can't come from inheritance or, or uh, you can't marry into it. And I'm just going to just pick the brain of those people. So the link is in the description where you can subscribe to my second channel. It's called Mill Tickets. I'm building it up. I got an interview coming next week. So make sure everyone um, subscribes to that. I appreciate it. And also, Johnny Dell has a hell of a channel, especially like uh, and you could clarify what you do in the off season, but I know during the season you break down the film at a really high level um, that 
no one is really doing outside of you and maybe JT O'Sullivan are the only two people I see breaking down film. And JT really focuses on the quarterbacks where you just kind of just focus on the whole game. So I'm sure most of you guys are subscribed to Johnny Dell already, but if you're not, uh, make sure you do that right away, please. Um, and then uh, what are you doing in the off season? What's your schedule on, on your channel during the off season? So most weeks we go Monday and uh, live Monday and Friday, usually at 7 a.m. Pacific time. We kind of found that's that's our slot when not a lot of other people are on. Uh, we're doing our podcast. I went and covered the Senior Bowl this last year with uh, Steph Sanchez. We were both hanging out, making notes together. Uh, that that girl, that's made, great. She's got a she, one. She's got a great eye for uh for evaluating players and two she is an eagle as far as spotting 49ers personnel people we'd be sitting there and she'd have her binoculars out and she'd be looking across the field she'd go hey the 49ers are over there looking at tackles i'm like well, yeah how do you know and she, she'd say well you know that's the the regional scout for this area he's over there and he's talking with uh, adam peters i was like yeah world um so it was, it was great so we we look over some of those where the four ers are news on that stuff and just kind of break down where they are uh most of my film work right now is happening towards my members website we're going through starting to get into some really deep dives into the scheme of things and the ins and outs because uh it's one it's one thing for you know me to know some of the stuff i want to help people learn and be able to watch stuff because i've i've seen so much where people like i want to see the all 22 this seems really fascinating and then they put it on and there's nobody kind of walk through what are you actually watching it's yeah a little overwhelming um because everything happens so fast and you're mm -hmm. sitting there rewinding it 10 times I, I i watch film all the time and i know pro coaches who watch film all the time and they'll sit there and go yeah i watched it i watched this play 15 times to figure out what happened um you know it's helping people identify where where is this and let's learn about the scheme yeah i want to talk to you about that uh that's the thing is a lot of people don't necessarily know what they're watching right and and i'm sure you've seen some trends with football and let's i want to touch back in on that because i do have some questions for you of where you see offenses uh evolving in the nfl so remind me because I, I do want to ask you questions about about that uh real quick uh, dave barkley who's just the man uh gives me a, a 1999 super chat says good morning ryan and the new new guy john if you don't know man dave you got to check out johnny dale man he's He's been doing this a longer than longer than me, and he breaks down film, uh, which not a lot of people are doing. So he's a, he's got a really good channel. It's called just Johnny Dells, right? No H. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No H in there. Johnny Dells Football Academy. You can Google it, and usually that's what just shows up. Uh, it'll take you to YouTube, or you can just look it on look at it on YouTube. I have each season in playlists. So I, I what I try and do is go and review each game. Like I said, JT O'Sullivan's a QB school, and JT does a great job. Okay, JT obviously. Uh, a lot more experience than I do played in the league for 10 years, played under a lot of different systems. And um, so he comes from a really good knowledge there. I'm looking at the game as a whole and saying, okay, how, what is the story of the game here? People will say, well, why didn't you include this play? Why don't you include that play? I try and pick 20 to 25 plays throughout the game. That's really what my time has able to do as far as some deep editing and say, these are, this tells the story of the game of why the game ended the way it was. You know, for example, if there, we really struggled with Jake Brendel getting to the second level in the run game, and that's why our run game was not working, and then we couldn't get to the play action pass, you know, oh, well, I'm not going to show the seven times that Jake Brendel did that. I'll show two and say this happened a bunch of times, you know, sort of stuff like that. And, and looking at some of the key plays, this third and nine, we missed this receiver that was open, you know, or uh, third and third and nine, we gave up this play because this guy busted his assignment, or we hit this big play because this happened, you know, that sort of thing yeah yeah it makes dave check him out man he, he's awesome and he says uh ryan cold at 60 i'm out here i know you're in montana uh with a t-shirt on shout out to the chat and hit that like button to help our guys subscribe if you haven't keep up the good work ryan he also says sign up for meal tickets to y'all dave man uh again as always man thank you so much for the support dave's a hell of a guy man veteran uh just a great dude and he's got a voice for radio if he ever wants to switch his profession He's ready for it. Um, yeah, so please subscribe to Mill Tickets and subscribe to this channel and Johnny Dale's channel if you have not yet. All right, we got a lot of show to dive into, a lot of stuff that uh, I'm going to be talking about on this channel to this morning that has not been talked about yet, maybe at least or at least confirmed yet, or, or I don't know what the proper word is, but let's dive into it, man. Let's just dive into it. Um, let's get into BA first. So, again, I was telling Johnny before the show, uh, you know, I'm not 
Ian Rappaport. I'm not Adam Schefter, but I do have some people within the organization that I I reach out to a lot and they respond sometimes. Right? <laughs> Every now and then <clears throat> they'll actually give me an answer. A lot of times they leave me on red um, guys I've known for a long time. So uh, I, I reached out about Brandon Ayuk, asked him what he thinks is going to happen. This is what he told me. He says, uh, Brandon Ayuk believes he could have a greater individual career outside of the 49ers as a featured receiver in a pass-heavy offense. Winning the Super Bowl also remains a top priority for him. And, of course, he would play for the Niners if the money is right. But he has a number in mind that he is unsure the 49ers will reach. I want to get your immediate reaction to that, Johnny. Uh, sounds about right. Um, I think that's where the the rub is with the 49ers and Brandon Ayuk. I think uh, what we've kind of been able to read on the tea leaves from Brandon Ayuk is that he believes he's a top receiver in this league, and he should. Uh, he wants to have the attention and be able to get the notoriety and the paychecks that come along with that. Um, when you look at a guy like Tyree Kill, when you look at guys like Mike Evans, when you look at guys like Devontae Adams who – are talked about, they get the paychecks. Brandon Ayuk wants the same thing. Brandon Ayuk is an X receiver, right? So he's not the same position as Debo Samuel. That X receiver is the guy that's got to play on the line. That means he's got to be able to beat press. He's not given the advantage of space that the Z is being on, on the same side as the tight end and off the line. It's, you know, the X is that prototypical Jerry Rice, uh, Randy Moss, um, Larry Fitzgerald, you know, your number one X receiver. The Z is like Anquan Bolton to Larry Fitzgerald. That's what Debo plays. Uh, so Brandon Ayuk is your guy that you're facing one-on-one -on -one man coverage where they're not going to roll safety help over to is usually to the X because there's fewer receivers over there. They're going to keep that safety a little bit more over to over the tight end, over the, the Z because there's more opportunities for pick and rub routes. So, your ex has got to beat the other team's best corner most times. And that's Brandon Ayuk, and he's been doing a stellar job of that, over 19 yards per catch last season. So, you know, but this is a team that we had uh, we had about as many rushing attempts as we had passing attempts. I think it was like two different. I think we had two fewer rushing attempts than passing attempts. Most balanced offense in the league, uh, as far as in today's NFL, by a mile. When you look at even the Detroit Lions, as a run team, they had 100 more passing attempts than they had rushing attempts. So if you're Brandon Ayuk and you're saying, you know, look, I had, I just had a, a big year, 1,400 some yards, you know, all these touchdowns. And I'm on the team that is really throwing it at the lowest percentage of any team in the league. How much bigger would my production be if I go to another team? If I'm on the Bills, you know, <laughs> who are looking for a receiver right now, am I putting up 1,900 yards? Am I putting up 22 touchdowns sort of a thing? Mm -hmm. uh, and if I'm putting up those kind of numbers, what kind of paycheck am I getting? I'm getting $29, $30 million a year. And if the 49ers are turn around and say, well, you know, you're not producing quite like Tyreek Hill, we're not going to pay you $30 million. He's going to sit there and say, yeah, because I'm running in your system. And so I could be an, a top five receiver in this league, and I should be paid like it. That's the the struggle there is is what I think his market value personally is 27 to 28 million a year. That's what I think his market value is based upon where everybody else is um, and where the cap's gone. So will the 49ers reach up to there? I don't know. Yeah, that's that's what I think it is too from process, process of elimination from multiple reports and seeing where everyone else is getting paid. It seems like to me that Brandon and I probably expects around that 27 million mark and the 49ers seem like they probably don't want to go above 23. And so the question is, Will they meet in the middle at 25? Is Brandon Ayuk willing to do that? Are the 49ers willing to go that high? And I, I don't know. And, and I'm wondering, based on what he told me, is does this mean that trade and fifth year option is is more likely? Um, because I don't I, I don't see the 49ers paying him 27, 28 million dollars. And if that's really what he wants, and if he's going to stick to his guns on that, I can see the 49ers exercising their fifth year option or trading him. I think it. It's more likely than to me now than it was before I heard this information. Um, I, th I think it's a possibility. And the Niners even, John Lynch even said that he's open to the fifth-year option um, for Brandon Ayuk. And I know a lot of fans are like, oh, he's not going to play on a fifth-year option. Like, I don't think people understand. Like, if he doesn't, then he has to do it the following year. Like, you ha he, has he would have to accrue that fifth year, uh, fifth year for the 49ers. He can't just sit out and then be free. 
if he sits out the whole year, he still owes him that fifth year the following year. So he doesn't have a, a lot of leverage. Um, he could, you know, be a jerk. Doesn't seem like that's who BA is. Um, I don't know. I, I I talk to Croc every Monday. He comes on my show and he thinks he he says seventy five percent chance he thinks Brandon Ayuk is going to play on the fifth, on the fifth year option. What based on everything you've heard and, and you know and everything I I just said, what do you think actually happens with Brandon Ayuk if you had to you had to bet money? If I had to bet money, I'd say nothing happens before training camp as far as news because. And I, I just talked about this on my show that I think really negotiations in earnest aren't going to happen until at least middle of May. I think what the four ers are going to do, and this has been their history with a lot of their big time players, is they really wait till after the draft to start negotiations in earnest in the sense that they keep their flexibility open. Because if you're the 49ers and you're sitting there on draft day and a team is offering 15th or 16th overall pick for Brandon Ayuk, do you take that that trade? most likely because you're looking at you know you're like that that would be a, a i think a lot of people would, would would really say okay yeah and i think in this draft yeah there's some really good wide receivers there and you get another guy for four four or five years on a rookie deal and somebody else goes to get to pay him now he's not the proven commodity that brandon Ayuk has been but if you're the 49ers that's a deal that makes sense so are you gonna back yourself into a corner with Brandon Ayuk at $28 million a year to then turn around. And if you trade him, you're owing this massive amount of dead money. And I love Brandon. Ayuk. I want to be a Fort Anner for a long time, but there's the business side of it says you wait until after the draft. You just do because his draft, uh, capital as far as worth will be highest when you are able to trade away his fifth year option in that whatever team gets him has locked him up for this year. And they have that ability to extend him and drop that cap number. They have all they keep all the cap flexibility of that guy on that fifth year option, whatever team gets him. So that makes him more valuable. That means the Fortnite can up his asking price. If it's coming along with a big contract that they're they're already dealing with that they did not write themselves, they did not structure themselves, that fits their cap philosophies, their cap planning, then they're not going to pay a premium for that. So you wait until after the draft. If there's a trade that happens, it happens right before the draft, during the draft. If there's no trade that happens now, okay, let's see if we can make make this contract work. And that's I think we, we usually look at these contracts negotiations drag on into training camp a lot. I think a lot of times it's because the 49ers generally do not sign guys who are under contract until after the draft. And so their their real contract negotiation period isn't February through August. It's really middle of May, June 1st, probably OTAs as they bring guys in and have a face-to-face and say, here's where we're at. Where are you at? Let's start negotiating. Um, That's where I think it's going to happen. And I think that's why there's a lot of speculation and uncertainty on it. Uh, Like you said, you know, it's, I think this is what Brandon Ake is not certain that the foreigners are going to meet that because I don't think they've had earnest talks yet. And I think that's where he's probably getting frustrated. He wants to get that guaranteed money. He wants it in there. The 49ers are going business as usual. We're going to do this after the draft. Yeah, it's one of the things when you're a 49er fan, you have to. It'd be nice. A lot of teams seem to do it early, right? Like some some teams seem to like prioritize extending guys early. The Niners have never been that way with George Kittle, Debo, Nick Bosa. It all gets dragged out to the very end, which makes it. Uh, it's kind of tough as a 49er fan because we want to know what the hell is going on. This Brandon Ayuk stuff is definitely the biggest off story of the off season for the 49ers. And it, I honestly think everything is on the table. I think they want to really extend him, but I also think BAs might be dug in on a number. We'll see if they can meet in the middle and compromise. Um, but like, I, I've been big on that. Hey, I don't want to trade Brandon Ayuk because to me, he's the kind of player. He's the Buckner. You don't trade a, a Buckner. Like he does everything right. That being said, if you can get like a top 16, 17 draft pick in this draft, that's also very hard to turn away, especially when you're the, the other option is paying Brandon Ayuk a whole lot of money. So I don't know. I think I would be open to something in the top 15, even though I'm the, I, I also said I wouldn't trade BA. Um, you know, rumors of uh, us trading with the Bills for the number 28. To me, that I would never trade, not for 28. That's not enough for me. Um, I need better, but we'll see, man. I really think everything is on the table with this one. Um, and it could just end up being like everyone else. And right before 
the season starts, he gets extended. Could be what happens. But I do think the fifth year in the trade is more on the table than some people um, consider. So it wouldn't surprise me three weeks if he's traded on draft day. I think it's definitely a possibility. Um, all right, cool, man. All right, so the other thing I asked him about was, uh, are the I said, are the 49ers really ready to pay? Is, I said, is Kyle Shanahan all in on paying Brock Purdy? And this is the response I got. He said, the 49ers are fully prepared to give Brock Purdy top quarterback money. But then he followed it up with, he needs to have a steer to his prior performance. And they also said the 49ers are going to try every trick in the book to keep that contract as low as possible. I don't know what that means necessarily. Um, what's your response to hearing that? Uh, sounds about right. Yeah. Um, I think they everything coming out of 49, 49 to bar the way says, yeah, you know, they're, they're fully prepared to give Brock Purdy that top tier quarterback money, which is going to be 55 million a year. That's just what it's going to be. Um, I think he's now again, they're, they're also going to be at that. They're expecting him to have a year like he had last year, but if there's a serious drop off, they're going to say, eh, let's hold on a little bit. Um, you know, let's, let's look at this again. Now with, everything we've seen from who Brock Purdy is and how he carries himself and how he's approached uh, football. I don't see that happening. I think you're going to, you know, if anything, you're going to see Brock Purdy continue to grow um, much like the corn that is planted off of his recent, most recent <laughs> sponsor, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, which is hilarious just to see. People um, are still mad at me real quick. People are so mad at me. I, I, I retweeted it and said, this is uh, kind of corny as a joke, you know, because it's about corn. Yeah. I like, almost uh, did the same thing. I mean, it's a dad joke. I mean, come yeah, on. It's, it's, it's yeah, put on a joke. tee for you. I mean, come yeah. on. It, there's, right. It's so easy. Like, you have to. You, you have to. And people were mad about I, I like They're like, why? They really thought I was calling Brock pretty corny, man. It's kind of funny. Yeah. Well, and it's it's to me, it's like when somebody says, hey, I'm going to run to the store. You have to say, oh, I would drive. I mean, you have to. <laughs> right. it's, it's there. Right. You have to make yeah. a joke about it. But yeah. – um. I think uh, on on the last of it, use every trick in the book to make it as low as possible. I, I really think what you're starting to see, and the Eagles to me really set the framework for this. If you look at Jalen Hurts' contract, it sounds absolutely massive. You know, it's like 45 million a year uh, and all this stuff. If you actually look at it, it doesn't climb above $30 million a year in cap hit for the first four seasons of his contract. So he's sub $30 million cap figure for the first four seasons. Uh, Jalen Hurts is. Now, how did they do that? They gave him like a, a five-year contract, and then they slapped on three void years, three or four void years on there that had massive amounts of prorated bonus money. So he's a really low cap figure for a big window. I mean, their window with Jalen Hurts, they set up to be eight years as far as reasonable cap figures and especially with the cap going up each year uh, the, the the downside on that the the hard part on that is that they have a balloon payment on his cap figure that's due i think it's in 2030 or 2031 that is like 97 million dollars he's it's literally he will not be under contract that year and they have ni a 97 million dollar cap figure here's why that's not necessarily as bad as that sounds is that essentially what you're starting to see and the saints were really the first team to go in this direction and they got screwed by 2020 is what ended up happening but where teams are saying while we have a franchise quarterback we're going to keep just shoving this cap down the road and each year so what they're what the eagles are going to do is when that 97 million dollar balloon payment cap figure comes up they're going to renegotiate his contract they're going to sign him to an extension because if you believe that guy is your guy for 15 years you sign him to an extension then you now spread that 97 million dollars over a further five years six seven eight nine years even nine years so it's now 10 million a year at a time when the cap is probably going to be 300 million plus a year so it becomes a much more digestible cap figure as you keep doing it and you're going to kick that down and essentially you'll have one big balloon payment year when the guy retires that's what you're going to have which is going to be a reset year anyways if you have a franchise quarterback and you're looking at you know now we're going to move on for another guy and we're going to get another guy on a rookie deal we're going to have a reset year and that's essentially what the saints were planning and then they got hit with the cap with the COVID era cap deduction 
and they ended up $90 million over the cap. They were expecting probably to be about $50 million over the cap, have to you know suck that up, really take that hit. Uh, but the COVID year drop really screwed them. And they ended up having, that's why they've been in a problem for three years, because just to be able to feel the team and all the contracts they had hitting them sideways, they had to do stuff to just feel the team. It became very, very difficult. But that's essentially what you see teams are doing is while we have a franchise quarterback, we will keep adding on void years. We'll keep pushing this down. When the guy retires, we'll have a reset year and, and start stockpiling that cap again and just eat it. You know, that's, I think, what their plan is, because I think that's what teams have realized. That's what you got to do. And when you look at what the Chiefs have been doing with Patrick Mahomes, they signed him to a 10, 10 year deal, right? 10 year, $500 million year deal. They've restructured his contract twice since then and they keep they keep pushing it down down the road because they go we have patrick mahomes we're going to keep him on at least a decently uh digestible cap figure while we push it down we'll pay the bill all the way when he retires yeah man and i think brock purdy will play at least as good I, i've been saying this for a while like i think brock purdy with a full off season and the way the best thing about Brock Purdy is his mindset and his mentality and his confidence and his leadership. All those things lead me to believe that if he has an offseason, we will see improvement from him. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean statistically this season is as like he might be better in some areas and worse. Like I, I could see him getting more yards, but also more interceptions. I could see him, you know, maybe his completion percentage drops a point or two, but he's having more success. He can have a less successful statistical year and actually be a better quarterback um or hey, maybe statistics go up too i don't know but i i really believe brock pretty will have at least a, a similar layer year to last year and i think that means they're going to pay him now the people don't realize a lot of people don't but the 49ers can extend brock Purdy after this season but they don't have to and so if there is some kind of drop off which i don't expect um they don't have to extend them they could ride it out another year with Brock Purdy. So that is on the table. Um, but I thought it was interesting. The, the most interesting part about this was he said, because everything else is kind of common sense, but they'll try every trick in the book to keep his number as low as possible. I didn't really understand it, but after you explained it, now it makes more sense to me. I'm like, what are they, what do they mean by that? Um, but actually I think you kind of gave us a great explanation as, as to what they could do. Um, I got some, a really funny story story about Travis Ward. I sat on a call with Travis Ward and uh, what's his name? Austin Moss, who's the director of player personnel yesterday. Uh, hilarious. Before I do that, I got to pay these bills. Give me 30 seconds. We'll be right back. What's going on, 49er fans? Thank you so much for watching the show and subscribing to the channel. Hopefully, you know already, but just in case you don't, the main way I provide for my family and the business I've been running since 2009 is Hensley Real Estate and Mortgage. If you live in California and you're financing, refinancing, buying, or selling a home, I would love to assist you and your family. Visit my website, ryanghisley.com, or schedule an appointment with me. The details are in the description on how you can do all of that. Let's make this happen for you and your family. Now back to the show. I appreciate you guys sitting through that corny commercial, man. I got to... You know, one thing I've, I have like a few affiliate sponsors, um, but I just kind of decided recently, like my bread and butter is my my own business. So instead of bombarding everybody with a bunch of affiliate sponsors, I'm just going to plug my business, Hensley Real Estate and Mortgage. So hit me up if you're anywhere in California. I'd appreciate it. Dave Barclay, man, who continues to be the man says voice of radio is better than face for radio. Yeah. Somebody told me once I have a that's me. A face, a face for radio. Uh, he also said, I think if we're going to lose our guy because Niners don't call his number enough. B.A. is for badass and he's my favorite guy on our team. Should have got rid of Debo and kept Brandon. He deserves the cash. I mean, I like them both and Debo can be extremely exciting. But if I had to get rid of one, I would if I had to pick one, I'm go I'm keeping B.A. That's just how I feel. How, how do you feel, Johnny? It's hard. They So they both create problems for a defense, and they create opportunities for an offense, but in very different ways. Brandon Ayuk keeps that off the defense from just being able to come out and play single high man coverage every single snap because he's going to be your your man coverage beater. I mean, we've seen the guy on the, on those blaze outs where he's you know running that 15-yard break-in, cut-out, uh, out route, and he's the guy that's sitting there hitting those drift routes over the middle uh, where 
you know, just is able to eat on those. He's he's able to run those comeback routes. He's able to run. You know, he you can you can have Brandon and I you can win at the entire route tree. I mean, how many times do we see Brock Purdy making that high anticipation throw, that most dangerous throw in it in the NFL, which is that ten yard out route? Most people think, you know, it's all the stuff with the middle because <laughs> the PTSD from Jimmy G. But it, the most dangerous throw in football is is the 10-yard out route because that's where the corner has had to back up the least. And that ball, if it is just two feet off the off the target, if it doesn't have enough zip on it, that's a pick six. I mean, yeah. it's it, – uh, Patrick Mahomes threw a pick six against the Raiders on that out route. Okay. That's why they, they make these quarterbacks throw that ball at the combine. They want to see the far hash, uh, a 10 yard out route. Can you get it there in time and it not be a pick six? Brandon Ayuk and, and Brock Purdy, money on that. And the problems that creates for a defense when you can put four guys on one side and you have Brandon Ayuk isolated backside, 10 yard out route, and you can't defend it. Oh, that creates problems. You have to change your defense now. You cannot run that. So that's what Brandon Ape does. Debo Samuel, on the other hand, you can put him in the slot. You can put him out wide. You can put him in the backfield. And suddenly now you have a guy that you cannot allow your def- your def- a defender to be one-on-one in space. If it's a linebacker, he's too fast. He's not going to tackle him. If it's a corner, he's not big enough. He's not going to be able to take him down one-on-one. So they create problems in different ways and matchups. And you put Debo Samuel in the backfield. Do you bring a corner inside and try and play him in the run fits? Man, that's tough. Well, yeah. Now you can't play some of the coverages that you want. You know, it, they, they both create different problems. To me, if I was saying the skill set that is hardest to replicate and that the 49ers need mm-hmm. is Brandon Ayuk. And... And, I, and again, what we talked about is will they pay enough? Are they going to pay $50 million a year in their wide receiver room in just two receivers? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, that that's a tough pill to swallow. Yeah, I mean, I think they could do it this year because the cap hit would be pretty low for BA, even maybe next year. But I think that's pretty much it. After that, they are gonna they can't have both. So, And we're going to talk about that also um, if we get to it. Uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, – is this the last ride for this group? There's there's several players that I'm like wondering like if this might be our last year together. Uh, Brent, uh, David, thank you, man, for the – not David, Dave. Thank you for uh, the support as always, brother. All right. So yesterday I got invited by uh, a friend of mine to, to jump on this Zoom call that they were having. Some company paid like a lot of money. It was like – they disclosed two payments that they made. One was 5000 One was 25000 it was hard for me to figure out who was getting what, um, but they paid Charvarius Ward and Austin Moss, who is the director of player development, to come on this Zoom and speak to their audience. And there ended up not being that many people on this Zoom, um, and so it was interesting to be there. And so it, 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 here's the funny part about it, right? And and by the way, I uh, I like Charvarius Ward. I've I've talked to him a little bit off the record, like. Uh, through message and he's actually uh, hilarious but uh and he gave a good quote so let me start with the positives of this uh the quote he gave me which was awesome was uh, talking about they asked him where he gets his motivation from and he says it's internal i had a real tough life growing up i wanted the finer things in life i knew i had to grind because no one was going to do it for me so i thought that was a great quote i posted it on 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 twitter about charbarius ward but here's the funny thing so that call was supposed to be like about a financial because the guy, the the Austin Moss guy he's he's kind of there for their mental well-being but he's also like the financial advisor for the players for the 49ers and kind of guides them on how not to go broke through all this and he's a very intelligent guy but so the point of this whole call thing was like kind of give that kind of guidance to the viewers and um like so here's this not they start the call and Traverius Ward looks flustered He's like, I'm having a bad afternoon. I'm having a bad afternoon. And um, it, 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 come to find out, he was on the side of the road because he ran out of gas in Dallas. So even if, so the thing was about financial guidance, right? And you got a guy who's got millions of dollars. I just thought it was funny. He ran out of gas on the side of the road. So he's he's doing the call from in his car, sitting on the side of the road, and he's out of gas. And he was paid to be there. And the funny thing, he after like four minutes, he was gone. So he left. He didn't even finish the call, and he was paid to be there. 
and it was all because he ran out of gas. I thought it was hilarious. Like, you know, a lot of people think you run out of gas because you're like broke or something, but I don't know. Maybe he just didn't want to stop for gas. I don't know. But Tavares were run out of gas yesterday and ended the call early. I'm not sure if he has to give his money back that he was paid for that gig, but um, pretty funny stuff, man. Actually, yeah, yeah. I don't wow. know that. Yeah. What do you think about Brandon uh, Tavares were running out of gas? Have you ever ran out of gas? Uh, once it happened once. I what I and the worst part was it was a I borrowed somebody's pickup. Uh, my pickup had broke down, borrowed somebody's pickup. I'd never driven it before. And they were like, this, the guy, he was a real old guy. He was a World War II veteran. So, you know, hats off to him. Um, he babied this little pickup. He loved it. So I, and, and he was like really reticent about even let me uh, start it up and drive it out of the driveway. And so I was like, just freaked out, stressed out about, I cannot do anything to this vehicle. So I wasn't paying attention to the gas gauge at all. And I totally ran out of gas about three blocks from a gas station, had to have, have somebody help me push it out into a parking lot, walk down get the gas can. That's the only time I've ever actually ran out of gas. I've, um, I've been terrified of doing it ever since. I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to front. I ran out of gas so many times in my twenties. I was <laughs> I was a, I was so broke, man. You know, like it, my teens and twenties, I ran out. I probably ran out of gas ten times in my life, but haven't done it since then. So it's been a good 15, 20 years since since I ran out of gas. Uh, but yeah, I, I just thought that was funny, man, because you would think there's no way Charvarius Ward's running out of gas. Um, but interesting story. And the other thing I, I learned, I learned from this Zoom. Oh, before we do that though, Charvarius Ward, man, I do want to get your take on this because this is very curious to me. Tyler Noah Hufanga, Charvarius Ward, Diamador Lenore, all out of contract after this year. That's only Ty Jair Brown is in contract past this year. So out of the four DBs that you anticipate starting for the 49ers, only one of them is in contract past this year. Are you surprised? Well, maybe not with Charvarius because he's a little older, I guess. And maybe they want to see how this plays out this season, even though he's done a fantastic job. I'm more surprised about Diamondo Lenore not getting an extension yet. Maybe it's still possible, but how do you see that whole situation with the 49ers DBs and their contracts? I think they're going to wait to see who plays better this year. Mooney Ward is, is a guy that he's had stretches where you think he's just a guy um, where he seems like, and then it turns out, oh, he was dealing with some, you know, issues physically. And then once he got over that, then all of a sudden he looks like the guy that, they thought they were signing when they signed him, and they paid him big money. Uh, Diamador Lenore, though, is a guy that has played at a pretty high level wherever they put him, has not quite been able to be in one spot and be that all pro level. So, what do you, where, where do you, uh, which guy do you let walk? Because you're not going to take, keep both of them. I think, you know, of those three guys, you're probably getting two of them are walking. Um, who are the two? And if you're trying to decide whether it's the safety coming off the injury, if it's Demo, who you can put in the slot, and he's a very good slot guy. You can put him outside, and he's a very good out outside guy. You put Mooney Ward on the outside, and you're getting all pro production most of the time. Um, that's just, I think they're they're going to see kind of how that shakes out throughout this year, um, and and what the what the actual buying cost is going to be i think corners are going to get just more expensive safeties haven't quite gotten as expensive as you would think uh as, as, especially comparative to corners and i think diamador lenore personally i think he's going to want money to be an outside guy uh slot guys don't get paid real well you know just look at kwan williams um just look at jimmy ward you know they don't make near what the outside guys make uh so i've heard i've actually heard that that that's that's his thing he doesn't want to be a nickel niners obviously don't care right like they, jimmy ward's a good example of that they're, they're going to play you where they want to play you but i have heard that that uh Diamond lenore would much rather be an outside corner than a nickel yeah and i mean if it's a skill set if it's uh, there's not as much dirty work. You tend to have a longer career, and you get paid a lot better. I mean, you get, and it's not a little amount either. It's right. it's anywhere from seven to ten million dollars a year. I mean, uh, so when you guys sitting there saying, "Well, you know, am I going to throw sixty million dollars down the drain because 
uh, I'm not played in the spot that I think I can play very well in. No, you're, you want to be in that spot. You want to be paid like you're, whether or not they put you there, you want to be paid like it. And, yeah. uh, and so, you know, I, I think that's where it's going to be. Uh, Avery Thomas has been uh, the, the nice way to put it is up and down. Uh, mm -hmm. He has not been where they want. Now, I think the, the kind of wild card here is Daryl Luter. Uh, I think last year, the reports were that he was doing really well in, in mini camps and OTAs a lot better than they thought he was. And then had the injury issues and wasn't able to really, you know, get his feet underneath him as he's coming in and trying to play catch up throughout the season. And Daryl Luter is an interesting guy. I remember seeing him at the combo or at the uh, senior bowl that year. Uh, he stuck out because he's a bigger guy than you think. Like when he stands on the field and he's standing across on that wide receiver, you realize just how long he is long in the arms, um, which is something that the 49ers value in their corners in this primarily cover three system. Now it wasn't as much that with Steve Wilkes, but if you look at the corners, they draft. Or in sign, Shaveri's Ward, Mooney Ward, he's a lanky dude. I mean, Richard Sherman, what was he known for bringing into the league when he came in was length at that cornerback position. Uh, yeah. You look at Ambry Thomas, same thing, speed and length. Uh, when when they tried to make, uh, uh, what was it, the safety, um, uh, Tarverius Moore, when they tried to make him a corner, they drafted him, he was a safety, they tried to make him a corner, didn't work out. It was the same thing, speed and length. Dude had a lot of long arms. And that's what you get with Daryl Luter, is the same sort of thing. He's a guy that's got some speed and a lot of length. So he makes sense as an outside guy. I think they want him to be a guy that could take over. I think that's, an, that's a wild card in there of who they pay. If he comes in and he's not doing what they want, if they can't get a corner that they really like in this draft, I think you see Hafunga walk. Um and they're going to have to figure out what to do with paying both of those guys. I yeah. think if Daryl Luter's showing what the signs they saw early that they really like, I think that's part of also why they're not paying either of these guys right now is I think you let one of those guys walk. Now, who it's going to be is going to determine be determined by how they play this year. And then you sign Hafunga, you keep him, and you look at where else you're going to do. I, I think those are the, the kind of the evaluations they're going through right now. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I also think 49ers need a free safety. And because it seems like Huff and Brown are pretty much very similar. Brown's probably a little better in coverage, I would I would say, to be real. But um, they're very similar. I think all of this leads me to believe, you know, not only Looter, and there's Womack. Who knows what Womack can become? But I really think what it means is they're going to invest in this draft in a safety and a corner. I would expect both of those players to be drafted at some point in this draft. Now, do you know anything about it? This is kind of random, but Taylor, Taylor Hawkins, is he more of a free safety, strong safety? Do you know anything about him? He, so he's mainly been a special teams guy, his mm -hmm. snaps in there. He he's gotten some decent snaps during preseason. And, uh, and I remember him having some snaps there against the Rams at the end of the year. Um, what you like about him is his aggressiveness. Um, not the smoothest of hips is what I remember seeing from him on film and sometimes struggles in space and tackling if he, if he's able to fill and it's a, uh, it, it, it's not a, a big space fill. Like for example, if it's going to be an outside run and he's got to fill that, that that third gap outside he'll fill aggressively bring some wood and and does a good job there uh, it's got some explosiveness downhill explosiveness i like that i don't know if he's going to be in a, a full-time start just because again that's a little bit of stiffness in the hips and so swiveling there in the deep portion of the field is going to be a little tough for him uh and so he's, he's more like a strong running. safety than too it sounds like right yeah the problem with him being that you know primarily box safety is uh the lateral quickness wasn't there for me anyways what i saw uh, like where where I, I look back to is uh if you look at how the lions play when i watch their their tape scouting them one thing they love 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 to do was get their running backs in the flat on linebackers and safeties if it was a mismatch so they would figure out are you having a strong side rotation safety, weak side rotation safety? And then they're going to end up getting their running back in the flat off of just, you know, quick uh, concepts there to get the running back there in the flat versus a positive matchup for them. One thing that Steve Wilkes did that I, I will say I really thought he did a good job of is when we played the Lions, 
is a lot of times he ended up having Jair Brown in the flat on their running backs. So that really paid dividends. It was a fourth and three, the first fourth down that the Lions failed to convert. They were they ran a play that I watched them run probably eight times on third and shorts uh, on film where they it was just a, a spacing concept. They run a little inside curl route and a flat route with the running back. And they almost every time they got a they got a first down. There's one time they didn't. It was against the Rams, and the Rams had got a safety on their running back, and he made a play. And on that play, Jared Goff, Jared Goff drops back. They did a, a late weak side rotation of the safety, and he's got Jair Brown on the running back, and he can't go there. That was where he wanted to go with his first first read. First read is taken away. He has to reset because that gave Nick Bosa enough time to get some pressure. So he steps up, tries to throw. It's a little bit of an off pass, and it just misses the receiver off his hands, right? Fourth fourth down, change the game. So all that to say, um, with the 49ers, when you have guys like that, I would say he's a box safety, but when you struggle in space, teams are going to then put you in space. And so uh, what I've seen with the 49ers, generally as a, as a – kind of a trend for the since Shanahan's been years, they want mirrored safeties. They want safeties that they can have as interchangeable. They don't necessarily want just box safety, free safety. They want, we can bring either guy down or we can bring both guys back. We want guys that can fill the and be and fill that kind of outside gap and that C between the C gap and then sometimes the three gap with that wide nine. So they've got to be able to fill inside the tackle or tight end. They've also got to be able to fill that outside toss but they need to be able to cover it. That's where they really want those guys to do. So tackle in space and be able to have some hips to move around. And that's where Hafunga really improved after his rookie year was he was late on trying to adjust in the back end where he looked slow. It just made it look like he didn't have speed. It was really he wasn't anticipating what the offense was doing. Next year's season, he comes back, he improves on that, is all pro. So that's where Jair Brown, I think, needs to improve. That's where the 49ers need to improve. Tayshawn Gibson was not an answer at the end of the year. We're getting beat on those talk on those crap tosses. And that's that safety. He's got to come down and he's got to fill. And teams, once they saw that our safeties weren't able to do that because we either had Logan Ryan in there or it was Tayshawn Gibson, and they were not able to do that, they went after it. And Kyle Shanahan talked about this last week about the crack toss. He said our those safeties have to be able to do that. And that's that's a question. I, I don't love this draft for safeties, I think. Um, but safeties generally don't go off the board until the third round. We're going to see, you know, uh, I, I, if if you see a guy go into the third to the 49ers at safety, that tells you where they where things stand with Hafanga. It may seem weird at the end of the third round to look at that, but where safeties generally go and where they're valued, that will be a big, uh, I, I think, precursor. If they don't draft a safety till fifth, sixth round, I think that starts telling you where they're looking at. Yeah, a, a couple of prefaces to this, and I had a I had a ton of questions I wanted to ask you, but when I talk to you, it brings up other things that I, I'm more interested in. Uh, um, and real quick, the other. The other thing I got from this Zoom call is uh, I learned the 49ers have an emotional support dog. So that, that was the last tidbit I wanted to pop in there. And actually, I, I love dogs, so I, I'm 100% down with that. And I guess it was brought in because um, Solomon lost his sister, and it was brought in in 2017, okay. and it's been here ever since. But let's move Did on. Did they breed? I didn't, I didn't get that info. I should That should have been a good mm -hmm. follow-up question. I got to be a better uh, journalist. Um, but yeah, so that, so that moves on from there. But one thing I was going to say in regards to what we were just talking about is the fact the Niners are kind of giving some clues to, to me about how they see things, right? They, they brought in Julian Blackman. Obviously he, he, he went back to the Colts. So that does make you think maybe they're at least a little nervous about Hufunga maybe coming off the injury at minimum or worst case scenario. Maybe they don't, I don't know. They, they definitely have interest in safety. The other thing they have interest in is tight end despite drafting two last year they they tried to sign brock uh whatever from from the lions the lions end up matching their offer and he's still with the lions so those are a couple clues i think of things they're still looking at but before i dive into that stuff i got a question for you that just popped in my head because you are such a good evaluator and you watch a ton of 49ers film the 49ers were absolutely trash against the run last year I'm curious as to why is this per, is this all personnel or was there something they were doing schematically um, that Steve Wilkes was doing 
that caused this problem? Or what, what do you think it was? Why did the Niners struggle so bad against the run last year? Well, you know, I think there's there, there's a number of answers there. Um, when you look at how the 49ers generally played their defense last year, one thing they did that was there was an absolute commitment philosophically from this from the get go was we are not going to give up runs on rundowns. So that's first and ten. We are not we are not playing a too high defense, which is not happening. Um, in the sense of traditional cover two. Now, D'Amico Ryan's ran a ton of palms coverage on early downs. Now, that's a little bit, it looks like a too high defense, but it's a little bit different in that you do allow your safeties to be be closer to line of scrimmage. Essentially, palms, you're going to have your two safeties. They're going to be around the hashes or really just inside the tight end um, if the tight ends are their side, 10 yards off the ball. So it, it allows you to keep two safeties pretty close to the line of scrimmage. And then it's a coverage conversion where, you know, it won't get into all the weeds on that. But um, it can be cover four. It can be cover two. I remember it was the Chargers game last year when we we played them. Uh, it was the second half of that game. D'Amico Ryan's ran palms like it was all but I think three snaps the entire second half. And Fred Warner talked about it after the game. He was like, yeah, we pretty much just ran one play call almost the entire second half. And it was just Palms coverage. They kept those safeties close to the line of scrimmage, but also had the ability to drop back. Um, when you look at the way Steve Wilkes was, it was like, is it, it was like they changed some of the, the handoff landmarks for linebackers where before some of those handoffs, they carry routes only about 10 yards to, a, to 12 yards deep. They're now going 12 to 14 yards deep. And that ends up putting your linebackers in more space for one, two, they start dropping back a little bit faster. Three, what you had was they started allowing that third linebacker sometimes to get into space on guys. I, I think of a, uh, it was Oren Burks against the lions there was some there was two plays in a row we gave up some big runs and and what it was or it was it was a first a pass and then it was a run the first one they put Oren Burks on their running back in the flat like we talked about and then they turned around and uh and ran an outside zone and if i remember right Oren Burks went too wide again because he he got burned by not getting wide enough in the flat on the pass he goes too wide gets out of his hole and they give up, give up like a 10 yard run up the middle. Um, what you had there was, I, I think Steve Wilkes had this mindset of, I'm not going to allow mismatches in the passing game. Okay. Well, yes, I understand you don't want to get Warren Burks on that running back in the flat, but that now means you're bringing a safety down on a certain side that's very predictable. And that means your run fits become very, very predictable. And that makes it harder on your players. And uh, I, th I think philosophically, when I look at Steve Wilkes' defense, I say, you know, where Robert Sala and D'Amico Ryans were all about, we're willing to accept a mismatch on the back end in passing to make sure that our front has the matchups that they, that'll be ideal for them. It was the opposite with Steve Wilkes. It was like, he was willing to let there be mismatches in the front to keep from having a mismatch on the back end. Mm. And I think that bled down to the run game because now you're seeing some things became a little bit more predictable. And, and it was always like when Steve, this is why they'd be hot and cold. Steve Wilkes, when he was able to stay ahead of the offensive coordinator on that kind of stuff, then they were fine. But if it ever became that offensive coordinator started to be able to leverage him on that, it was just too predictable. Perfect example, Super Bowl, first half, they only give up three points, second half, then they they give up 23 points. And, you know, I remember I went and uh, painfully watched a handful of snaps from the Super Bowl 22. I didn't watch all of it. It was, I can't, I just can't stomach it. Mm -hmm. the, everybody talked about that, you know, that big, it was a, a third, third and six or fourth and six, I believe. Um, they converted the crossing route. And it was like, oh, my gosh, you know, and, and there was like this was the moment that Kyle Shanahan decided to fire Steve Wilkes what was often forgot about or not noticed on that play. Patrick Mahomes had a, they ran a, a mesh concept. We were burned by it a bunch of times on the year. They ran a mesh. He had a guy wide open for a touchdown on the other side of the field. 
Um, literally, there was a busting coverage. Nobody picked him up coming across the field. The guy had nobody within 20 yards of him. You know, it's like the game would have literally just been over right there. Um, and uh, and yet, you know, it, it, it went on for a little bit longer. All that, all that to say, I just felt like philosophically, the approach that Steve Wilkes had just did not mesh with the 49ers identity, which is we are first going to stop the run and earn our right to rush the passer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I didn't know exactly why, right. I don't watch as much film in as much detail as you do, but I had a suspicion because the personnel was either the same or better, right. They, they added Hargrave who's maybe not the best, the run defender, but he's an, uh, an improvement over what they had prior and such a dramatic drop off for the 49ers run defense i figured there was something that had to do with wilkes and that that's probably part of the reason why they moved on from him i want to get your take on this how do you think the 49ers fared this offseason like you know they lost some guys they brought in some guys how do you think they fared are they better or worse you know maybe a little both or how do you see what the 49ers have done this offseason in free agency I think they've created more questions. <laughs> um, uh, you know, uh, it's it's so hard grading offseason moves. Because like you said, last year, you would say by grading the offseason moves, the 49ers defense was going to take another step. And they were going to be great. Um, didn't. Took a step back. So, uh, and, and now, I think the way that they've approached this offseason was what I was expecting last offseason. I remember last offseason, I was I just started my podcast, I was recording, and I recorded a show. It was the opening day of free agency, and I was like, guys, just settle in. We're not going to make a big splash signing. We're going to be looking for bargain signings. We're going to do all this. There's not going to be a big splash signing. I know there's some names out there. It's not happening. I just don't see it happening. And then I, I, I like uh, had scheduled it to go live six hours later. And then three hours before it goes live, news breaks that we signed Javon Hargrave. And I scrapped the show, <laughs> went and did a live show instead. Um, it, because I just I didn't think they were going to take that approach. Now, they did last year. I The approach they took this year was what I thought they were going to do last year, which is looking for bargain value with high upside. Uh, a guy like Leonard Floyd, who he made sense to me. That's the kind of signing I was expecting last year, which is a guy that is not going to be top tier money as far as, you know, market value, but has consistently good production and brings an element that they need. And it's why they traded for Chase Young is that they needed that speed off the edge because their their rush philosophy with Chris Kasurik is all about creating space in the rush lanes. It's all about do we allow to give our guys two way goes? So, you know, it's not about necessarily just condensing the pocket because then, you know, if you give your defensive tackle only a one-way go, that's easier for the guard to get get him. That's why they go and get a Javon Hargrave, who is really quick and can win on a two-way go with quickness versus the guard. So you need a speed guy to drive that tackle deep so that he your your defensive end can push that, create a two-way go in space for Javon Hargrave, create a two-way go for Nick Bosa on the other side. Then they usually run a plugger role, which is to try and occupy the guard and center that's left over. And so they needed that speed element off of the edge, but do you pay a premium for it? They were able to get a, a, a value at that. And th that's why also Gross Matos makes sense to me. Again, these are speed guys, speed rush guys. Mm -hmm. They thought Drake Jackson was going to be that guy and be an every down defensive end. He has not turned into that. Um, so I I like, I really like the Leonard Floyd signing. I think he's a guy that has been very productive. Now, yes, he's played with some studs everywhere he's been. Part of why, part of his success. But look who he's playing with here. He's playing with Javon Hargrave. He's playing with Nick Bosa. He should, you should expect 10 sacks from him this year. You should mm -hmm. expect that. And, and I think it brings that element that helps you schematically. It says, we're now going to push that left tackle to, he, he now is going to be a yard deeper on his set. You know, three feet makes a big difference when that guard has to, has to defend pass rush on Javon Hargrave with three more feet of space that he has to defend. That's tough. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I like that signing. I, I think they're getting bargain value uh, that has high upside. Devondre Campbell is another guy that makes sense. You know, he's, he's had some productivity, has had some other issues, but they're not looking at him to be a full time guy. They're looking at him. Can can you just make it so we're not putting Flanagan fouls on a guy all the time, <laughs> you know, yeah. and hoping that he doesn't miss tackles, which he always does. 
Um, it seems like and, they're also is, there's a theme of health from everybody mm-hmm. they brought in. Like all these guys have been healthy, uh, play a lot of games, right? I think that Eric Armstead kind of shell shocked them a little bit, and Javon Hargrave or Javon Kinlaw, Kinlaw. as well because they just weren't available a lot throughout their time. So I think there was a theme of let's find guys who have been durable as well. Uh, you know, availability mm-hmm. is is the the most valuable uh, ability a lot of the time. Um, yeah, I, I, I think you're right, man. I, and do you think there's a – I don't think there's a drop-off. I, when I look at this team and the guys that have left, I really don't see a drop-off in any position at all, really. I mean, it's either equal – or improving. Let me see what I have marked down. Yeah, I the mean, only it, position... maybe safety, right? With the loss yeah. of, uh, with the loss of um, Gibson. Um, yeah, of course. I, I felt like Gibson had had dropped off this last season, especially mm-hmm. near the tail end of this last season. His play was just not anywhere close to where it was. Uh, the biggest concern for me is defensive tackle outside yeah. of Javon Hargrave. You know, what what a guy that's really interesting to me in the draft that I think is going to be available uh, in the mid to late rounds is McKinley Jackson. Uh he's a kid that I remember my notes on him from the senior bowl was reminded me of DJ Jones. And when you look up his measurables, same height, same weight as DJ Jones and he moved just like him. I think that's what they really need. I don't think they need two absolute studs there all the time. I think they need a DJ Jones, a guy that's able to hunker down, anchor against the run, be good there, that is able to win with quickness sometimes uh, in the passers, but you don't need an every down production from him. You need somebody who's going to be able to fill that role there. And that's a kid that I really like, but I think they need whatever, however they go about getting that role filled. I, this defense has not looked the same since DJ Jones left and his ability to help on those early rundowns and say, we're going to take this away. And, Javon Kinlaw was a kid that, man, he was so frustrating. Had Would have flashes where he'd show you why they drafted him where he would. Then there'd be other times he would get himself straight ejected from a hole. And you're like, I mean, moved three yards down the line. And you're going, dude, you can't have this happen. You just can't have this happen. Um, so, you know, that's the biggest question mark for me this season, for this year, not necessarily going forward, but this season is how do you really address that other interior defensive alignment? Yeah, I got a million questions for you, but we probably don't have enough time. Let's end on this one. Uh, you brought up one guy, but is there another guy? Who, do you have a draft crush come in this year? I do. Um, well, I've got I've got a bunch, uh, <laughs> but uh, I'll tell you one uh, at wide receiver. Luke McCaffrey's been my draft crush. Mm. Uh, so, um, I and the reason why I, I think he's going to be available in the mid rounds. And I think he fits what the 49ers do. We, the guy he reminds me of is Cooper Cup. Uh, he has a very similar 40 speed. Uh, he doesn't have the production that Cooper Cup had. But again, remember, the kid only played one year of wide receiver. He was a quarterback before that. What Watching him at the Senior Bowl, I didn't know anything about him. I went and started looking up stuff after the Senior Bowl because he caught my eye so much there. Was one absolute feisty and tenacity in the run game which is something the 49ers value from their running backs a lot, or sorry, excuse me, wide receivers a lot. Uh, I remember there was one play, uh, we are sitting there and it was near the goal line. And all of a sudden you saw a corner get absolute pancaked and you look over and who's on, t- on top of him, holding him down, not letting him up. I, even as they're blowing the whistle was Luke McCaffrey fighting, you know, on, on the ground. That's the kind of thing you love to see from 49er wide receivers. That's Brandon Ayuk, right? The other thing I really loved is he you could tell real high football IQ. He understood when to sit down in zones, when to present himself to the quarterback, because he was a quarterback. He was able to identify where, you know, what the defenses are and and adjust his routes just accordingly. He's quicker than fast, good short area quickness. Um, he's bigger than you think. He's six foot one, but he showed everything you would expect from a guy with the last name of McCaffrey. Really high football IQ, understands how to play the game, and he fits the 49ers' identity. And I think he fits a, a role that they're going to need going forward. I don't see them paying Juwan Jennings past this season. I don't, you know, especially if Brandon Ayuk's the guy they're gonna if they're gonna sign him. You're absolutely not signing your third wide receiver to anything more than two million dollars a year. And you just don't have the budget for it. So I think he fits their identity. He fits so much. And he's available at a bargain value pick. 
Um, but it's one of those that I looked at and I was like, okay, what I don't want to see is this kid go to the Rams because you put him, I mean, he's, he's got such a similar skill set to Puka Nakua to Cooper yeah. cup and you put him there. God, you're, you're dealing with trouble. I think he could be a, a dangerous guy in space. He's not going to have that blowy off the top, but that's not what they're asking. I think he could be a, ph- a phenomenal number three receiver for this team. Well, with the name McCaffrey, you would think he's going to be at least have the mental side down. Uh, and it sounds like he's going to be available. They won't have to get him very early. Now, I have, I have said the 49ers are definitely going to draft a wide receiver sometime within the first five rounds, probably even four, I would guess. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I could see it happening. You know, a lot of these guys, fans get fall in love with because of their name. But I think it may be the opposite with McCaffrey. I think McCaffrey is probably being a little bit underrated because people are comparing him to his brother um and i've heard good things about him so it's interesting you know what johnny i owe you an apology man your name's johnny dells and i've had johnny dell in front of you this whole entire time man and you're such no. a super for not telling me and I, no it's it's fine actually i, I do go up. by johnny dell um so uh you have it right um Usually okay. it's just Johnny Dells as it, it's a it's a possessive apostrophe. So it's Johnny Dells as in it's my football uh, academy. Yeah, I get that. Okay, people get that confused all the time. Like, dang, I probably should have done that a little bit differently because I get people confused all the time. But yeah, it's just a my nickname in college was Johnny Dell. And it's just a mix of my first and last name. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay, good. So I didn't mess it up. That makes me feel a lot. No, better. you're good. You you nailed um, it. <laughs> uh, I could talk to you for probably like five hours straight about football. Um, but I can't do that. I am actually going to be appearing on, uh, I think Nick, Nicotina invited me on his show. So I'll be there about uh, 1030. Shout out to Nicotina. Uh, he just dra- uh, launched a 49ers channel. Um, what's going on on your channel? And just remind everybody again where, where they can subscribe. Yeah, so you can just hit me up at Johnny Dell's Football Academy there uh, on YouTube. That's where I'm primarily. You can also follow me on Twitter at Johnny Dell's. Uh, you know, it's been it's been a fun ride. Uh, I started this channel now five years ago, and it's just been wild. I didn't. I thought I was like, man, if I get 200 subscribers, I'll be shocked and amazed. Yeah. Um, and just you know, seeing the support from the community has been fun. Uh, I'm, I still see myself as uh, the the one of the small kids on the block, and um, and so I'm just fortunate and feel fortunate and thankful for everybody and awesome content creators like you who bring me on and give me a chance to talk about the 49ers. I mean, how awesome is that? I get to talk about the team I love since I was a kid, man. I grew up a yeah. 49ers fan, and yeah. uh, and you know, ride or die and Good times, low times. We're still 49ers fans. It's also helped me mentally in some ways. Like the last couple mm-hmm. of years, I, I was always like, I wasn't doing podcast stuff. And so when we'd lose and it was a heartbreak, I'd just sit with it, man. And and being an analytical person, I'm just sit there and like overthink things and overanalyze. Being able to talk about some stuff has kind of been like a, a way of processing through the grief. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it's been fun and uh, I just appreciate it. So thank you for bringing me on. Yeah, man, five years, man. I've been doing this, I think this is eight month 18. And so I know the work that goes in, especially, I mean, what you do is requires a lot of work. How many hours does it take to make one breakdown video? How many hours? Uh, so, re- so <laughs> review after a game is anywhere from 14 to 20 hours. Uh, yeah, so usually, wow. yeah. And, and I, and I work a full-time job on top of it. So that's yeah. the hard part is football yeah. season usually runs me pretty ragged. I'm usually putting in 70 to 80 hours a week when it's all said and done because, mm-hmm. uh, so if I get the film like 11 AM Monday morning, I'll usually be done watching. Cause it, it's, it's just two hours just to sit and watch without rewinding any plays. And it's going to be, usually it takes me four to four and a half hours to get through it. And, I imagine uh, yeah, this that's is my wife I'm saying it's yeah, rough, that's right? My wife. Yeah. She's like, I was just thinking rough. about her when you said that. I'm like, man, your wife, man, I bet she's. Yeah. And we got three little wife. kids. Uh, oh, she's, wow. she's yeah. a superstar. She's the, she's the real hero of the channel. Um, then I start working on the script of, or picking plays and working on the script. Cause I script everything out. Then I just go, go into the voice recording, then the, the, the editing. And if I'm lucky by the next day, it's ready. And usually I, I go to bed at 11 o'clock, wake up at 5 a.m. to, to get it going. Um, and then like when I've, when we've had some really high profile games, I'll do scouting videos. Most people don't realize it because those videos are usually about half the length and they take twice the work because what I usually do, like when I did the lions, I went and watched four of their games. So I'm, I'm doing the amount of, 
on my end, analytical work of four games. That takes me 16 to 20 hours just to just to watch, analyze, chart, do all that stuff. And then to be able to turn that around and try and explain to people in 10 minutes what you watched over 16 hours is a little tough. And so people are like, more scouting videos. And I'm like, I'm going to die if I do. <laughs> so, um, yeah. yeah, that's what goes into it. But off season, it's, it's nicer. We, it's a little more, uh, uh, much less, uh, high production schedule. <laughs> well, man, I appreciate you taking the time to join me today. Uh, like I told you when we were, uh, backstage, hopefully once the season starts, I'm going to be back five days a week, uh, 9 a.m. PDT every time. And, and hopefully we can get you to come back more regularly because you always do a amazing job make sure you guys are all subscribed to johnny's channel uh subscribe to this channel subscribe to my second channel details in the description where you can do that um again i'm going to be interviewing self-made millionaires on that channel so it's different from football looking forward to that uh johnny man great job as always look forward to having you again bud thank you so much yep absolutely all right you guys i'll be back uh monday 9 a.m with eric crocker uh i will see you guys uh, on Monday. Thank you guys very much. Have a great weekend. Thank you so much for watching the Ryan G. Hensley show. Your support is greatly appreciated. If you haven't yet, subscribe to the channel. The Ryan G. Hensley show is brought to you by Hensley Real Estate and Mortgage. I've been operating my real estate business in the state of California since 2009, and I would love to help your family. We are also sponsored by Hensley Solar. I can put solar on your house in up to 38 states. Underdog Fantasy is a sponsor of the channel. Please check out the details in the description to see how you can join Underdog Fantasy and get $100 matched in your initial deposit. And finally, I want to give a shout out to my sponsor, Blue Water Credit. They are the best credit repair company I've ever dealt with. If you want to fix your credit, reach out to Blue Water Credit. D 